do as well. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is half past ten, so I'm going to start the meeting. Uh, apologies. I've got apologies from... I've got apologies from Councillor Mark Aldred, Councillor Roger Jones, Councillor Angeliki and Councillor Roy Walker. Councillor John Hudson has come as a, a deputy for Councillor Roy Walker. Um, are there any more apologies? No? Okay. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Adam Clark from Stagecoach, Guy Warren, First Manchester, Bob Dunn from Diamond, Nigel McKenna from Manchester Transport, and Angie Ryder from Go Ahead. Uh, you're very welcome to the meeting. Uh, I also want to say, can I remind you, if you're asking questions, put your hand up, whatever, can you turn your mics on and off? Uh, after, turn them off after you've spoken. Okay. Declarations of interest. You've all got the form. Yeah. Chair, just item five and eight, item seven. Okay, then that's fine. Uh, minutes of the meeting held on the 12th of July. Uh, can somebody move them, please? Okay. Uh, are there any questions, comments? Yes, Councillor Ansett. Thank you, Chair. It's just a general one. Uh, and obviously, uh, I was reading to the point where it was talking about the uh, reports on the changes to the bus network. And, put on, and uh, whilst it does sort of mention uh, some councillors raising some points, it doesn't mention others who raise points as well. So uh, I'm not sure how we best deal with it because it's a little bit inconsistent in that sense of it. Uh, so, so, I mean, if they're going to say that uh, a number of members raise a number of issues, or if they're going to start naming, I think they probably need to mention other councillors who are raising things, or sort of mention none. Uh, I think it's, because uh, I know I raised some issues myself, obviously didn't appear, whereas other councillors, I'm not saying I should have appeared there personally, but I think it's just a little bit, could we perhaps look at actually how that's sort of uh, worded so it's actually uh, a bit more consistent, if possible. That's not a complaint, by the way, it's just a, a sort of comment, hopefully positive. Yeah, we'll pick Thank it up for the next meeting, don't Thank we? Thank you. And this is Bob Morris taking us through this. Thanks, Chair. Good morning. Uh, this report, report previews a well prospectus that is currently being produced for GM. It is GM's request for short, medium and long-term interventions to improve rail-based transport, where we know the demand will double between now and 2040. Um, to achieve world-class connection supporting economic growth, rail has to play a major part. At the same time, we also need to address some of the short-term issues we face within GM. The report will be uh, the prospectus will be produced by the end of August uh, in time for party conference. But in summary, we want to make best use of GM's existing rail infrastructure carry out capacity and connectivity improvements, create a devolved and accountable network, and integrate rail and non-rail nodes so we can transform our entire transport network. Happy to take any questions, and members are requested to note the contents. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, really glad that this is going to be ready in time for the party conferences. I'm just wondering what the, the plan is in terms of, uh, are we going to have stalls at these party conferences, or, or what's, what's the, the plan in terms of, I guess, I guess lobbying um, at party conference, really? Or if you can give me an outline, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, this committee and the predecessor has historically had um, a lot of cross-party influence and support around party conferences. Um, so we'll circulate a note round to all members. Um, there is a plan for fringe receptions um, at, at conferences and um, TFGM officers support members as lead members um, at each of the three main party conferences. So I'll send something round. Rail prospectus will feature as will our network as well. Um, so it's probably better if I send the note around and obviously members of this committee um, will be involved in the receptions as well if they appear at party conference. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm just looking through it. It looks uh, it's going to be quite a comprehensive document and something that I'm sure we'd all welcome. I just wonder if there's a possibility of it being circulated to members of the committee at that point, because obviously uh, it, uh, no one can do justice to what it's going to appear that in this short format. So thank you for that acknowledgement. Okay, thank you. Did you put your hand up, Councillor Sheep? 
No, was it you, Peter? Yeah, Councillor Robinson, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm disappointed that I didn't see anything in this report or prospectus about disability access across the um, region. And I think we need to get that in. We're massively behind times with it. Thank you. That'll be noted. Any more questions, comments? No? Okay, we'll move on to item six. Um, this is tackling crime and antisocial behaviour. I'd also like to welcome David. What, what's that say? David Rose. D David Rose uh, from British Transport Police. Okay. Bob Morris and Lucy Kenning are going, uh, are going to take us through this report. Good morning. Um, we've um, circulated a number of slides um, with the papers to the meeting, um, so I don't intend to delve massively into some of the detail around them, but I'll pick out some key points as we go through. Um, the first slide um, just gives you a bit of background in terms of the Travel Safe Partnership and where it's come from and how it's continued to evolve. There's been a number of um, significant changes to it over the last few years, um, and obviously we've got a period of further evolution to come. Um, as you can imagine, we've got uh, an established governance um, process around the Travel Safe Partnership, um, and that's um, to coordinate our activities and our decision making and formalise any reporting lines that we've got. Um, we have this year published uh, a three year strategy that all the partners um, have signed up to and articulates our three strategic aims. Um, I do have um, uh, we, we've got a number of copies available um, which we can provide uh, uh, afterwards if people would like these. Um, but clearly there's lots of activities that fall within each of those strategic aims. Um, we've not developed the uh, strategy in isolation. Um, we've, we've given consideration to both the local and national context around crime and antisocial behaviour, in particular uh, the GM Standing Together Plan, um, of which um, the three priority areas within that document, tra travel and transport, is woven into the fabric of that document as well. Um, there's a slide in there about the fund budget and funding model for Travel Safe. At present, it's a partnership without any independent uh, financial standing, and that is something that we want to formalise and move forward. Um, and so we've got some proposals around how we do that um, in the next financial year. Um, and I've, and the, the, this slide just articulates some of the, uh, the key spending that we uh, undertake, in particular staffing back office costs and some overtime for the Greater Manchester Police to support special operations and major events where we can see that there's a significant uh, impact to the transport network. What I do just want to focus on is the approach that the partnership has established over the last 12 to 18 months. Um, we've really um, we've brought a number of different partners into the into the Travel Safe Partnership. Uh, British Transport Police and my colleague, uh, Chief Inspector David Rams, um, is, is here today. Um, in order to further our reach and um, look to absolutely uh, problem solve rather than simply move problems around the network. The issues that we face on rail, uh, Metrolink and bus are, are similar, and so we absolutely want to adopt a problem-solving approach. Um, and working together to understand what that looks like leads us to a range of um, options that we might be able to employ to <coughs> try and help tackle those issues, whether that's schools engagement, whether that's strengthening the infrastructure to make people feel safer, or whether that is the boots on the ground deployment from uh, the police, uh, the different operators, uh, all of us. Um, the next few slides um, just really show you how we bring together the different data that we've got access to as a partnership um, to help inform our decision making um, and understand where issues are arising and what the trends are. Um, so um, that, that then helps us to use the information and intelligence to target our interventions to where they're needed the most. Um, and then we, what we do is we break that down um, both by mode and um, so we can look at particular geographical hotspots where issues may or may not be arising uh, as well as whether or not there's particular themes. So uh, you can't see it very well on the slide but that's broken down into different types of incidents against the person, antisocial behaviour, bylaw infringements, etc. And we do that as I say for both Metrolink and the bus network. 
Um, the partnership over the last uh, 12 to 18 months, we've undergone uh, a number of different challenges, um, getting to a position where we're confident in the quality of the data that we're using to inform our decisions, um, making sure the balance of um, resources across the partnership is, is, is as we need, um, embedding that problem-solving approach, and also pooling the collective powers that we've got. And obviously in February um, this year, TFGM achieved uh, civil injunction powers uh, under the Antisocial Behaviour Crime and Police Act. Um, so we're now working through what that means and how we can better use those powers. Some of the successes that we've, um, we've seen is our engagement, so some of the prevention activities that we're doing. Um, we've seen a huge increase in our school outreach programme. Um, I think now we've got the July figures, that um, figure is actually a 537% uh, increase in our engagement uh, this year than it was last year. And that's a, a key area for the partnership in cautioning young people to the consequences of getting involved in antisocial behaviour on our transport networks. Um, the next slide just goes through Operation Infinity, which is just an example really of how we might bring together our joint resources to resolve issues as and when they arise. Um, Operation Infinity was last July and was in response to issues on the Oldham Rochdale Metrolink line. Um, the results are, uh, are detailed on the slide, but that, that operation not only involved increased uh, police and Metrolink deployments in the area, uh, bringing in British Transport Police as well but also undertaking a recce of the line to target harden the infrastructure, a blitz on the local schools to try and identify those involved. And then um, just moving on to some of the successes, we undertake a, a, a day of action uh, monthly in the city centre where we collectively bring our resources together to help uh, engage with passengers, um, get, get the travel safe messages out. And we're looking at broader community engagement as well. Uh, last year we undertook a, a football tournament with uh, youngsters in the Oldham Rochdale area in conjunction with Oldham and Rochdale football clubs. And then just moving forward, um, in terms of what we were hoping to achieve, I'll just draw your attention to, um, we're looking at uh, the rollout of a, a public facing reporting system for transport, similar to British Transport Police's 61016 text number, which has seen great success. The, the final slides here, uh, unless uh, David wants to add anything, um, uh, uh, detailing the changes to Greater Manchester Police's contribution into the partnership, which is the formation of uh, a new uh, transport unit. Um, there's some detail in the slides uh, that, um, in terms of the establishment, which uh, the numbers are still provisional, and then a slide which just details the proposed duties that that unit will undertake. Um, but the, the benefits that we will see from that is the, the extended hours of working of Greater Manchester Police's unit, uh, which is supporting the broader partnership activities. Thank, uh, thank you very much. So first of all, I'd say thanks for the opportunity to invite BTP along today. Uh, really important that we're all working together for um, the safety of Greater Manchester. And there is a lot of cross-pollination between Metrolink activity and also British Transport Police. And my role here today is to say that we're absolutely committed to that partnership approach going forward and the greater collaboration between Greater Manchester Police and British Transport Police. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions, comments? Councillor Sykes? Thanks, Chair, and, and welcome to the opportunity of the, um, the report. I've got a number of questions, so it might make sense if I, if I just go through it. I noticed the accountable body is the GMCA Police and Crime Panel. Um, could I just ask were travel safe reports into that because I struggle when I look at its minutes to find any reference at all uh, and I'm, if that's your accountable body I'm just trying to look at where it is held to account there so that's that's my first question if I want to pause there chair do you want me to do the others and then you come how back many, how many? sorry how many questions uh, before a five chair I okay think. well we'll do them one at okay. a time um, then if you go over the page I'm really pleased to see um, in terms of the presentation, in terms of strategic aims, it talks about the third one being discouraged fur evasion. That is the only reference to fur evasion in this whole presentation and document. Have we got no figures? There's some scary numbers in terms of how many people ride, particularly the Metro network, and don't pay. Uh, and I'm very clearly of the view that if they did it, it'd pay for conductors, particularly on the Oldham Rochdale line, and it'd solve a lot of the problems we've got with antisocial behaviour and everything else. So I'm 
disappointed that there's nothing about all this activity and what it's done in terms of maybe the contribution to the coffers in terms of fur evasion. Um, if you go further through the presentation, um, interested on the modal breakdown, um, always interesting to say, um, and, and it's the one where it's the consolidated figures, says page, page 28 in mine, incidents of crime and antisocial behaviour month by month. Um, the spike increased potentially linked to the introduction of online, what do you mean potentially linked? It either is or it isn't. And where's the evidence? So how many things were reported online by GM? Is that the reason we've got a spike? Or are we just trying to explain away a, 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 an increase in the figures? Um, or have we actually made it, the people now believe it's worth reporting it? Because the consistent message I get to people, both on buses and trams, um, which has changed slightly, in, in fairness, is it's not worth reporting it because nothing happens. Now, are things happening? So well, that might be the reason people report it. Um, so I just think you need to justify it if you're going to put that as the reason for the figures to spike. Um, and if you go through the, the, the bus breakdown and then the Metrolink breakdown, I just think we need to all be concerned, and particularly on the bus, um, the offences against person, as well as the public order offences. Uh, are significantly higher on our bus network than they are on our tram network um, and I'd be interested to know why um, uh, if there's any particular reasons um, for that um, uh, and like I say Operation Infinity uh, was successful uh, but we've still got issues and we've still got a confidence issue uh, in terms of the travelling public we need to do in Oldham and Rochdale to get them back on the Metrolink network and then my final two points, Chair, uh, and thank you for your indulgence, is um, the look forward, the rollout of a single system, uh, the obvious question is when, and the development of antisocial policy and procedures. I'm really surprised we haven't got them, so the obvious question for that one is when. Okay. Thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, are you doing this, Bob, or have you been... I'm, I'm going to defer to my colleague um, Dave Byrne from uh, 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 the Deputy Mayor's office in respect of the accountability question, Councillor Tax, if that's okay. Hi, uh, good morning. Dave Byrne from uh, Beth Hughes' Police and Crime team. Um, in terms of the accountability, you're absolutely right, in terms of the Police and Crime panel, one of the things we are looking at is whether it's more appropriate for the um, steering group, Police and Crime steering group. Um, and there's conversations that we need to have with Jeanette Staley, who's the lead officer for that, um, to make sure that actually that, that might be the more appropriate channel, given that it's got the political members on there, GMP represented, Bev Hughes herself sits on the panel, so it might be more that we do with the police and crime uh, steering group routes. But like I said, the slide said it is proposed, so we'll come back to you when we have further details. Um, picking up the uh, point about um, the spike in the potential link to the online reporting, um, what our, our view there is that um, the online reporting has actually made it easier for people to report because we, we've seen the previous issues people were having reporting uh, incidents via 101 and the, the, the over demand on that service. So um, our, our view is that that, that is, has made it easier for people to report. Um, in respect of Operation Infinity, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, we still see issues on that line. Um, I, I was just bringing attention to a particular example of how we bring our resources together in a targeted way. Um, it, what, it, what it doesn't mean is that um, there's not business as usual activities across the different modes of transport happening. Um, but through our tactical working group, we identify what the current tactical priorities are for, for bringing the partnership resources together. Um, and in terms of uh, the text reporting system, a proposal went to the Travel Safe Steering Group on the 31st of July, and we're currently working through what that, um, the specification and costs may look like for that, and where are any, um, uh, with in, in conjunction with the combined authority. And in respect of our policies and procedures, um, we've been developing those in the background to support the pathway through to securing a civil future civil injunction to make sure that we've got that evidence base, uh, the use of exclusion notices um, being applied consistently across uh, our staff across the partnership. Bob, are you fair evasion? So with regards to the, the fair evasion, um, it's not the prime 
accountability of GMP to do fair evasion. That's down with the Metrolink operator. They've increased the numbers of staff and we've seen a subsequent decrease in fair evasion on various lines, noting that Oldham is still one of the worst, unfortunately. So um, GMP do support where we have difficulties, where we need to do barrier checks, but we don't want to tie up GMP staff checking tickets, to be blunt. Um, hope that answers the question. Right, councillor, sorry. Okay. Yes, Chair. I welcome the uh, report in the sense that it, it mentions the uh, launch of the, the new system um, in October. I just wondered, will it be, we've got a representative here from Greater Manchester Police now, I just wondered if it will be the intention of that new unit, transport unit, to deal with the hotspots that we've got. It's quite obvious from me, listening to councillors who are members of this committee, and also looking at the figures for the officers report, that the Oldham Rochdale area is a hotspot for antisocial behaviour. And we've heard this morning from one of our colleagues about threatens to staff on the Metrolink and things like that. I just wondered, will they be able to sort of <coughs> hone in on that and say, right, we'll deal with those hot spots first? That's, that's my question. Lucy? Okay. okay. Um, so the partnership uses our information intelligence and the data to help us identify uh, hotspots, etc. Um, and that's exactly why last year our, our Operation Infinity was developed. Um, the, um, um, the, the, our approach is, is about problem solving and pooling our resources. So Greater Manchester Police working in very close, uh, uh, working with Metrolink staff, with British Transport Police where we're at interchanges, uh, where we uh, cross over and that's, that's been really successful um, joint working, collaborative working in the city centre and uh, Rochdale and things as well. Um, but absolutely we look to um, pool our resources and um, to, to, to resolve those issues because the issues will be different depending on the, the issues that we're experiencing. Thank you, Councillor O'Rourke. Thank you, Chair. Um, Obviously, I know in the report that a significant amount of the uh, contribution towards the funding comes from first buses who are obviously withdrawing from GM Conurbation. Um, what approach have been made on sort of make, meeting that gap with the new operators? And, and on that theme, um, in terms of new operators, I know system, for example, Go North West are included in consultations. What, for example, about Diamond? Um, you know, it's already a point being made about the significant. Um, problems about uh, public order offences on buses. Are we, are we going to ha have we made those approaches? What work's been done? Where's that going? Um, so, first, have not currently, uh, they're, they're still very much part of the Travel Safe Partnership and integrated into our joint working. Um, <coughs> we have had uh, discussions with um, Go Ahead. <laughs> um, who are, are looking to contribute to the partnership and equally we've got an approach to make to Diamond as well but absolutely we're looking to further the reach of, of us. Jack, can I just make a second very very quick question? We mentioned fair evasion before and on a side note obviously with the new tap in and out on a Metrolink what will the £30 tap in count as because it's obviously not the full £100 fine if you get caught doing that but it does seem a bit of a grey area now. Currently, that won't class as fair evasion for the £30, because people are making genuine errors. They're not trying to evade. Building. Uh, thanks, Chair. It's just a simple one on the, the modal breakdown graph as part of the presentation. The, the ASB and crime incidents are separated between the different operators of shelters, TFGM, JC, Deku, and then bus stops as well. I just wondered what the rationale for because I assume those shelters are all bus stops anyway. I just wondered what the rationale for splitting them down in that way was, and I would be concerned if it made it look like there were fewer incidents on the bus network and then the policing strategy was determined based on lower figures uh, because of that. So I just want reassurance, really, that that's not the case. The reason for breaking down in that manner is that it's the owner of the asset. So JCD Co, most of the bus shelters you see around Greater Manchester belong to JCD Co, so we get the information from them. Councillor Adsett. Oh, 
Thank you, uh, Chair. A uh, couple of points, if I could. Uh, first one, uh, obviously, uh, it's been looks like it's been refreshed. This organisation, so it's been around for uh, a few years now. So, obviously, some that I'd be interested to know on the first point generally is uh, what, how we're going to sort of publicise this work. Because we really, I think this is about the first time I've seen it. I know there was some. Uh, a couple of years or so ago, there was a lot of problems in my own borough, Trafford, where we had a lot of problems on the Metrolink down there. And I know our own antisocial behaviour team were quite involved with that. And the, and the publicity around that was around our antisocial behaviour team, not around this safe partnership. So I think if we're going to have it, then I think uh, it needs to be sort of maybe around the comms and so forth, needs to be looked at a bit more if possible. Uh, and in general terms, uh, Obviously, once individuals are sort of caught in that sense of it, uh, I mean, obviously, assuming they're not classed as minors, uh, what's the view on maybe sort of naming these individuals and so forth uh, on that one? And maybe also, uh, are we going to consider things like banning orders uh, from certain parts of the transport network uh, on this particular, if they're actually uh, continuing to cause problems? Thank you. Um, absolutely, we need to um, further the partnerships reach through a, a targeted comms and marketing strategy, and that is in our work programme for this year. Um, in respect of banning orders, that's part of when I talked about powers and, um, and the antisocial behaviour policy that Councillor Sykes referred to. So there's a, a process of exclusion notices currently in force on bus stations, and we needed to um, make that more consistent and look to see whether that's something we can roll out broad across the partnership. The civil injunction powers that we now have, um, where appropriate to, um, to proceed with one, does mean that we can then build in restrictions um, to individuals, um, uh, such as um, particular bus routes or places, um, as long as it doesn't interfere with their um, right to education. Uh, so also at one point, we, d we do actively work with the community safety leads and antisocial behaviour leads at the councils. Um, we've done some work very recently in Trafford uh, around that kind of the Cornbrook altering of the line, and we work very much with the, the team there to identify the issues, bring, uh, bring in the powers and, and, and interventions that they've got access to. In respect of the naming of individuals, is that something, Dave? Yeah, I, I can touch on from British Transport Police. I can't comment on Greater Manchester Police, but we actively, we, we proactively push that out to the media. So we've got a really successful campaign in relation to Twitter and social media and those aspects to it. So as long as they're not minors, like you mentioned, um, in British Transport Police, we're keen to push that out into the d public domain. Um, and we've had some really great successes recently in relation to that. Chair, if I, uh, if I may come in at this stage. Sorry to interrupt, Chair. It's um, Police Sergeant Matthew Picton from Greater Manchester Police, currently uh, Sergeant in the Travel Safe Partnership. I can probably answer some of your questions, the gentleman who asked in relation to how do we target problematic areas. Um, that's done on an intel basis, crime recording basis, so where intelligence comes in to suggest an area is problematic, which the Oldham Rochdale line clearly is. Uh, and that's our highest priority of customer sat unsatisfactory at the moment. That's targeted, so more patrols will be allocated to that area. The problem we have at the moment is we have only 10 PCs and currently running at 36 PCSOs. Granted, they've got limited powers but can show a great presence and, and, and do reassure the public and can gather intelligence but are limited in the powers and what they can deal with. The reason that we're going to the new unit is that we're going to have five sergeants, one inspector, 50 PCs, which is also going to include Operation Wolverine, which is our um, uh, vehicle leasing side, insurance side. So they're going to be coming on board as well, which also incorporates online reporting. So that's going to be something that's going to be new as well. So if people capture public order, for instance, uh, hate incidents, mobile phone footage that will now be available to be submitted online and we can deal with it that way which will streamline the process and make it a damn sight easier for us to deal with because they're quite labor intensive normally so that answers the gentleman's question though. i hope that's satisfactory in relation to the naming and shaming which the gentleman asked um, further down we have twitter accounts in gmp currently um, i've come from a traffic background in nine years on on, on traffic as a pc up until about six weeks ago, when I got moved over on, on promotion, we generally name people, unless they're minors, which you've obviously alluded to, we can't, we can't name minors for obvious reasons, but where someone is convicted of an offence, photograph name will be shown. Um, it will be publicised on Twitter. 
Uh, we have no issues in doing that. That's come from our press office and they're quite happy to continue that work. I'm doing some work behind the scenes at the moment to try and get us our own um, GMP transport unit Twitter account, which is solely going to be for this unit so we can publicise what work we're doing. In relation to the advertising to the likes of yourselves and the wider public, that's not been done to date because we've had issues surrounding um, notices being issued to the PCSOs and the, and the union, uh, Unison being involved. We, we've got to be very, very careful with the PCSOs, their employees, so they've got rights. So before we start advertising this to the public, we had to make sure that their business was dealt with. Hence the reason for the delay in publicising it. We've only just advertised the police constables' posts uh, last week, so that it's in its very early stages. But once we uh, have issued the PCSOs, the notices, which will be on Monday, then the uh, advertising work will, will, will commence and it'll be full throttle and it'll be done via a press office. So it will put out the um, billboards advertising, um, the press, media, social media. We'll be using every avenue that we possibly can to promote this. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. That sounds very encouraging. Uh, Councillor Marshall. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a couple of questions, really, for the police. Um, we're saying in the report that we're um, going to employ 57 PCs, 50 PCSOs. Is what was the actual breakdown as such? And sorry, Alfie. Um, what's the breakdown? And will these be solely for transport? They won't at any point be filtered out into neighbourhoods, etc. Will they be directly transport and transport only? Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, it's going to be one inspector, five sergeants, 50 PCs. That's going to be the initial numbers. Yeah, just, P just PCs, not PCSOs. PCSOs are being redistributed to districts to go back onto divisions. So the ones that we've got now will be redistributed throughout GMP back onto a normal division and will no longer continue the work in the Travel Safe Partnership. They will obviously be replaced, and there'll be a total of 50 police constables solely dedicated for the transport unit. Operation Wolverine then comes on board, and that's an extra sergeant and an extra seven PCs, which incorporates the online reporting then. So that will be an additional function, but will come under the transport unit. No, they will not be used for neighbourhood policing. Um, they will be solely for the transport unit. In order to facilitate those extra numbers, that transport unit brand will take on a wider responsibility. So it will no longer just be for buses and trams, it will be for cycleways, pedestrians, parking, um, stopping on zigzags outside schools. So there'll be a whole manner of transport related offences that will be looked at in relation to that. But the, uh, the main body of our business will be the antisocial behaviour and crime on the transport network mainly the trams and buses, because that's predominantly where uh, the fear of crime comes from. You, you obviously, you're stuck inside a metal box at that point. You can't escape it, so that's a quite worrying fear. Um, and the statistics back that up, that the crime rates on the buses are higher than they are on the Metrolink, so that's where we'll be targeting most of our resources. Councillor Riemann. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, um, I welcome the report. Um, it's got some really useful information in terms of what the Travel Safe Partnership is all about. One or two comments that I want to raise have already been raised, so I I'll restrict mine to one. Um, um, it's encouraging to see uh, uh, the launch in October of the specialist unit with 50 PCs, uh, because what's happening at the moment, despite of all the efforts that we're putting in, uh, unfortunately, antisocial behaviour and crime is of a major concern, which is putting a lot of people off uh, using public transport, which is obviously against what everything that we, we're trying to do here. I'd particularly like to draw your attention to an incident that happened on the Oldham uh, Rochdale line about a few days ago. Um, as a result of which, uh, my understanding is that the service had to be suspended uh, for, for a couple of hours. Now, surely that's not acceptable. Uh, rather than uh, tackling with the perpetrators, I think we've actually uh, inconvenienced the, the travellers. Uh, so uh, until we come to a stage where we know that this line is a problematic line and when there's an incident, uh, rather than uh, suspending the service, uh, I think we should be able to um, deal with the perpetrators. And I'm confident uh, that after uh, the, the, the launch in October, we will be in a better position to do that. But in the meantime, uh, it's, it's quite disappointing that we, we had to suspend the service rather than um, deal with um, 
the actual um, people who were causing uh, criminal activities. Thank you. Yeah, I think I remember the incident you're referring to. That was where a gang of youths were fighting on board the tram. So we stopped the service to allow GMP to attend and other passengers to get to a place of safety. As a general for lower level crime, we wouldn't suspend services. Any more questions, comments? Yeah, Councillor Leach. Thank you. Um, a couple of my points have already been answered, uh, but uh, just in relation to the transport unit, I've had slightly conflicting um, comments. First of all, we were told that these figures were provisional. Your comment seemed, it seemed as though it pretty much was set in stone on the, on the actual numbers. I just wondered whether these numbers were based on pre or post announcement by the new Prime Minister in relation to 20,000 extra police officers. Uh, and whether or not that had any impact on whether or not these were provisional or not. Um, 20,000 police officers would be nice, wouldn't it? Especially if they were all in Manchester. Um, yeah, obviously the, the, the promises that the Prime Minister are making are, are a matter for the, uh, for the ministers up in Westminster to deal with. Those are confirmed figures from my Chief Inspector. Um, and they were confirmed to me in an email three days ago. That advert has gone out and that is what will be recruited. Um, and just a uh, couple of queries in relation to the shift pattern. Uh, I was interested it doesn't mention bank holidays um, for extra hours. Um, it would seem odd that we would have five o'clock on Fridays and Saturdays but not potentially on bank holidays. I just wondered what, what the logic um, behind that was because those days are equally as likely to have very late, um, late issues about surrounding antisocial behaviour. Um, and what was my other point? I um, can't remember what the other point was now. So. Bank holidays will be, it's a cost implication, it's as simple as that. Um, there's no other way of explaining it. Um, GMP runs at skeleton staff on bank holidays force-wide, not just, uh, it's not exclusive to the transport unit. We, we only have what they class as core business, so motorway networks and uh, divisional staff, but it is it's skeleton staff on bank holidays due to costing. I can feed that back in. Uh, I agree with you. I think bank holiday weekends generally tend to be busier than any other time, so why wouldn't we have them? Um, I'll feed that back to the Chief Inspector, he can look at a cost and implication to that and we can look to cover it. But yeah, I 100% agree with you, I think they should be on there. Chair, can I just come in with respect to um, the numbers, the provisional numbers of the unit? Um, I'm sitting on the um, sort of group um, with Chief Superintendent Wazim Chowdhury, that's developing the broader remit and that's, that's why I use the term provisional because currently they're still scoping out what the, the broader duties and how that fits into the partnership and the um, uh, uh, road safety partnership as well, that's just, just for clarity. I've remembered what my last point was. It, it was just uh, um, to understand the reason behind the transfer from all PCSOs to all um, police officers and whether or not that had, to, uh, had anything to do with the, the type of work that they were expected to do or usually PCSOs tend to be in twos rather than ones. Is it about so you can have just one officer on, uh, on, on a particular job or is it to do with... Um, being able to powers of arrest and stuff like that? Combination of everything. Um, I think you've hit the nail on the head. Uh, PCSOs have limited powers. It's not their fault. They do a very, very good job in extremely difficult circumstances, but their powers are limited and they do have to be doubled up for a health and safety point of view because they're employees. Police officers are completely different. We're, we're Crown servants. We can work single crude. We have equipment, handcuffs, batons, CS, taser. Um, and yes, officers can be can be and will be deployed single crewed across the transport network. So instead of having 50 PCSOs, which is 25 patrols, you've got 50 cops, which is now 50. It, it makes perfect sense. Plus when that officer comes across something, they're in a position to deal with it and, and can deal with it robustly. So Robinson's indicated and then I'm moving on to item seven. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I'd like a comment on the um, fact that you're going to do the uh, school zigzags uh, I really welcome that. Um, will uh, councillors have to request that or will you be doing it as part of the programme? We'll be looking at putting in um, 
um, I can't think of the word, uh, enforcement orders via the council, uh, force-wide, to make sure that all school zigzags, box junctions, etc., are enforceable by the police, because, uh, as you probably were at the moment, some are enforceable, some are not. Um, a little bit like the 20 miles an hour speed limit depends what traffic orders put in place. So we'll be making sure through our routine business that the traffic orders, um, no entry speed limits, box junctions, zigzags, etc., etc., have all got the correct traffic orders in place so that we can just enforce them as and when we need to, which will, I think, will massively assist. Uh, we'll move on. Move on to item seven, which is transport network performance. And Alex Cropper is going to take us through this. Uh, good morning, everyone. For those who weren't here at the uh, first uh, new format of the meeting, this is a slightly revised report that you've seen uh, previously. It does have some KPIs and measures uh, attached in here that will produce um, every report, uh, and the metrics are also in there in terms of a bit of a glossary for those who haven't seen them. Um, I'll run through a sort of summary of the transport network, if that's okay, and pick out any key highlights, and then uh, happy to take questions. Uh, Metrolink has continued its, its good overall performance. Um, we still do have concerns around uh, availability of units, uh, and that's mainly down to road traffic collisions and uh, antisocial behaviour vandalism, uh, uh, an ongoing theme, uh, but that isn't impacting on the customer service uh, currently. Rail, uh, unfortunately, we've had a decline again in this period, which is July data um, from the previous two periods. Uh, we are engaging with the train operator companies and network rail. Uh, we do anticipate next period, this is July data, um, the weather-related incidents will have an impact on performance again next period, particularly um, the Toddbrook Reservoir uh, incident, which took up a lot of people's times, uh, particularly colleagues from GMP and Stockport, who did, who did a great job over the last few weeks. Um, bus is continuing to do well. We are in the summer holiday season now, so we have a typical improving trend. But as a positive, um, Go Northwest um, have uh, joined our team now, and actually their performance is, is really uh, pleasing to date. Um, highways network, again, we're in summer holiday season now, so we do naturally see an improving trend uh, out there on the network. And uh, we have got some good news in terms of upcoming major schemes such as Regent Road Water Street coming to conclusion this period. So hopefully by the time we get into September's report, uh, we'll start to see some of the benefits of that. A few key highlights. Um, event planning in Manchester, it's, a, it's an international destination and a lot of people are travelling, which is great. Um, Metrolink this year on Park Life um, carried the biggest ever patronage it's ever done. Great support from bus operators as well to make that a success for Manchester. Um, the report does pick up on crime and antisocial behaviour, but I think we've probably covered that enough uh, through Lucy's and the previous report. Um, just a couple more positives. Guided Busway continues to really do well uh, in terms of um, patronage uh, and pushing that, uh, and we welcome that. And we have got um, the Yellow School Bus Portal that's now in full flow, and the R Pass initiative that's keeping uh, offices busy at the moment at TFGM. But again, that is all looking uh, really well. Launch of Contactless finally. Uh, lost the mic then for a minute. Um, very few complaints, although we have got some issues that we are continuing to look at. Um, some of those have been picked up already today. Happy to take questions. Just a quick one of a could. Uh, on page 45 under, under rail, uh, and obviously allude to the timetable changes there, but obviously the, the point I want to raise is about how uh, we locally can actually help deal with overcrowding on trains and we have how we can deal with it on Metrolink uh, and buses obviously are different but I mean uh, in terms of trains how do we actually deal with that? So we are um, continuously engaging with the train operating companies. One of the key um, measures that we're looking at now is around short forming and the impact that has on customers and capacity and how we can get people um, onto trains. The rollout of the new um, stock hasn't been as seamless as we all would have liked. That hasn't helped. Uh, but again, we're getting uh, more and more commitments that that is going to happen um, in terms of getting rid of the paces and bringing a new fleet. Unfortunately, some of that is recycled fleet, uh, and we've had some teething issues with that, which isn't helping. So rest assured, we, we are daily um, contacting the train offering companies to uh, impress upon them the need to improve capacity. Um, 
Thank you, Chair. Um, just a couple of queries. Uh, on page um, 45, in relation to bus network performance, it would be really helpful to, to actually see how certain services, to have some detail about how certain services that we've changed, either to, um, with an increased subsidy uh, to try and improve punctuality, or, um, or in some cases a reduced service to try and uh, improve uh, punctuality, w whether or not the decisions that we've, been, that we've made are good decisions. Um, and so as bus network performance has improved in line with improvements in highway journey time re reliability, but I'd like to see whether or not the, the decisions that we're making are actually making a positive difference on punctuality. Yeah. Um, and then just a comment on page 46 in relation to highways. Um, specifically mentions the Regent Road works um, about nighttime working um, to, avoid, to minimise disruption. Mm -hmm. um, anecdotally, a few days ago I was uh, driving towards the large roundabout and two enormous HGV um, concrete mixers were doing manoeuvres on the street holding back traffic significantly at five o'clock in the, in the afternoon. Um, yes, it's a great idea to be doing work at night, uh, but then to be uh, bringing uh, materials and doing manoeuvres on the main road um, at the peak, most peak times uh, for traffic um, uh, leaving the city centre um, seems a bit daft. If we're spending more money um, to do overnight working, surely making sure that um, the delivery trucks are actually coming at um, non-peak times would be, would be not too much to ask. Um, and then finally, in relation to um, the network performance scoreboard, um, I probably should know the answer to this, but I'm just interested to know why we have non-applicable um, targets, so for Metrolink punctuality and Northern reliability, why, why don't we have um, targets for those, uh, for those things? I'll answer them in sort of reverse order. Some of those targets are actually quarterly targets, which is why they're shown as not applicable. So at the quarterly updates, um, we will put them in there, particularly the rail ones, uh, and we're not always in control of that data. The, um, the region road works, um, the night works that we're undertaking are solely to do the resurfacing works. So that's where we physically have to take out existing carriageway surfacing and replace it with new. And that's really difficult to do uh, during lane restrictions during the day. Actually, the day works are continuing in preparation for to make sure we can maximize the amount of work we do on the nights. However, I will feed that back to the project teams and just make sure that in terms of the planning and coordination of those works that we are doing our utmost to minimize disruption during the peak hours. If we can just come back on that. I mean, I, I, I support the principle of doing the nighttime working um, to reduce, uh, to, to minimise the amount of uh, disruption, but we will be paying extra um, for that work to be going on at night. So the, the least they can do is not disrupt the busiest time with deliveries of, of materials. It just seems absolutely crazy. The whole economy is of um, how we work and how we get that, it clearly we, the more we restrict ourselves during the day, the longer the program of work will take and the more expensive it will become in the, in the long run. The optimum balance of trying to get days and night works to A, minimize disruption, and B, keep the cost within the budget is, is a fine balance. But I will feed back your comments to the team and get them to look that we are continually testing that balance. Um, on the final um, bus question, I'll hand this over to Alison, if that's okay. It is our intent uh, in future reports to bring increased performance data for the individual modes that are in the forward look agenda for these meetings. So the bus one, I can't remember where it is in the agenda, let's say it's in November. We will specifically look at in detail more performance data. But uh, Alison, do you want to add anything? Yeah, just to say that we do uh, monitor the performance of all our subsidised services very closely. Um, certainly the changes that we recommend here we then do follow through, so we're more than happy to sort of share some of that information in more detail, either in the next report, regular report, or in the more detailed bus report to a future committee. Just, just to come back on that, it's one of the few decisions that we actually make in this committee where we are responsible for either spending money or saving money. Um, so it's 
it's the number one priority, I think, to, for us to actually see these figures, to see whether we're making the right decisions. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm just going to refer to, um, to the rail performance, page 45, and just focusing on the service deterioration that's been linked to the, the cascade of the, um, the 319 units from other train operating companies to Northern. Um, I, I, given that um, that cascade, I think, may well still be ongoing, um, have you got assurances from Northern that they understand the increased level of service failures, or do we expect there to be a further potential deterioration because that may be an ongoing issue? Um, Northern are more than aware of our position on this, and to highlight that instance, currently the airport to Piccadilly line is suspended because another one of these units has failed. So we'll be taking it up with them straight after this meeting. Uh, on the performance scorecard on page 47, when it refers to bus service reliability, punctuality, uh, punctuality and, and the other measure, uh, is that only for the subsidised network or is that for the network as a whole? Yes, yeah, for the network as a whole. So, um, uh, Councillor Leach has probably already picked it up, but uh, in rail, you know, we get a breakdown by operator. On Metrolink, in Appendix B, we get a breakdown by line. And obviously, depending on the issues, it, whether the issues are more severe with particular operators, it will require different action. So, I, I think it would be helpful, unless you've already answered the question saying it's going to come back in November or whenever it is, um, that we do get that kind of breakdown. Yeah, historically we have provided reports on the subsidised performance of the subsidised networks. That's something we'll pick up in the more detailed uh, report that we'll provide on bus to a future meeting. I, I'm talking about the commercial network as well. Yeah, certainly on that as well. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. I just want to pick up that point about the non-applicable targets. Um, you, you said just then it's because the data is quarterly as opposed to going to be done monthly. But it, later on in the report, it says that it's due to there being no industry standards set. It, am I just being confused here? Is that the same thing? And surely, we, it, you know, it would be beneficial for this committee if we could, if we like, if there is no industry standard monthly target, we, we sort of can get an idea and set one ourselves and sort of, because I have no idea if, you know, 3.8% achieved on Northern reliability. Obviously, it's got a red rag rate, and I don't know if that's just off point nearby or way off the mark. You know, no one does. Certainly with the, the heavy rail, there isn't any standards. We cannot get those targets from the people who provide us that data. Uh, the Metrolink, I, I will look at, because actually I think that is an error, having, having looked at that earlier comment, we, we should actually have, if you go to the glossary, you'll see what forms the red, amber, green rating. Uh, and actually, if it's more than 95%, which should ideally be the target, because it's green and therefore acceptable. So that, that can easily be fixed. That should be a 95% in that box. Yeah, if you don't mind, you said we can't get that data, but we can still get an idea for whether, you know, if, we, if we're able to say that it's red rated, surely we have an idea of what therefore would be green rated, and surely therefore we can base a target around that just more for information than anything, because again, I make the point, sure, sure, we might not have the, the actual information, we might not have the actual data because it's owned by the, the rail or heavy rail operators, but surely we're able to get a feel for it and actually put that in this report and give people an idea of what's actually going on. Because at the moment I'm, I'm seeing numbers, but right, I, I can't actually make a point of it. Can I just say, when we had the rail committee, you used to get that information, which I'll let Alex handle. Listen, I'll take that away and uh, see if we can come up with something um, which would be our assessment of what we think is an acceptable level. Um, quite, quite what that means and how we measure it, I'm not too sure, but we'll have a look at that. Uh, agenda item 8, which is forthcoming changes to the bus network. This is Nick Roberts. Thank you, Chair. Morning, everyone. Uh, a familiar report to um, update members on forthcoming changes to the bus network. This month is dominated by commercial changes made by the operators, and these are to come into effect from early September. We'll go through each of the three annexes one by one and invite comments, if I may, Chair. So we'll start off with Annex A. These are the services where the operators have decided to make a commercial change for which we feel there's no action to be taken by TFGM. Obviously, the operators are here today and well represented. Happy to open up that section for any quest uh, questions or comments. Comments, yes, um, page, page 66, I've had comments from some of the ward members from that area. Uh, quite 
Hello? Oh, is that me? Thank you. Sorry. There you go. <laughs> Alex B. Oh, it is Alex B. It's Alex B, not Alex A. Does it matter? Can we take the question now? Can, you take can, can we concentrate on Alex A yes, first? Can. Any more questions on Annex A? Yes, Councillor Lee. I think this is still on Annex A, page 63, the 181. Um, but it's, it's actually a more general point, actually, um, which I previously made, and I thought we had got some agreement on this. Um, it would be really helpful if we actually see um, the changes in service over a period of time. So this service is going from every 30 minutes to every hour. Um, we've previously talked about services that have gone from every 10 minutes to every 20 minutes to every 30 minutes to every 40 minutes. And then we're still making a decision that we don't want to um, any TFGM intervention. I just think it would be useful um, when we see these changes to actually see um, whether or not there have been any previous changes to these services to, to see how, how far the service has been degradated over a, over a period of time. Because it may well be that the 181 service has always been every 30 minutes and it's going to every hour, but it may well be that 12 months ago it was every 10 minutes and it's gone to every 30 minutes and then it's gone to every hour. So I just think it would be really helpful for us to, to see the change in service over time. So sort of historical context to the, yeah, not a problem, we'll do that. So just checking my notes again, apologies to Council Evans, it is actually an A, I was getting confused with something else I wanted to say, so apologies to Council Evans and I'll defer to him. Thank you, thank you Chair. Uh, right, the, the, uh, page 66 in Annex A. Um, <laughs> um, uh, the ward members in that area, that's quite a deprived area at the South West Estate and basically you're cutting the service and just running it down the A56 and not going around the estate. How, uh, obviously, uh, people are employed in Trafford Park, people are employed at the Trafford Centre and when, how, do you, how do you propose that they travel from the South West Estate to those places? Unfortunately, Ariva aren't here today, um, the one operator that isn't. Um, I mean, the background to, to, to the way that we look at the services is that we do think there are alternatives uh, and interchanges. So we're, we're quite happy to go back and give you a little bit more detail. But certainly the reason for us not inter intervening is that whilst it might involve a wait or it might involve a change, we do think there is an opportunity there for the journey to be made. I don't know whether there's anything that can be added by colleagues that have a bit more detail around this. So that, that's, that's our approach to, to, to looking at these particular services, but happy to go back and have a discussion in more detail with you. Uh, I've had quite strong representation. I'm familiar with the routes. I think Councillor Adsaid might have comment as well, which I'm happy to... Just to add further, because obviously uh, Nathan's commented about the Trafford Centre. The other concern, of course, is the access to the uh, Trafford General Hospital as well. Uh, if you know as well, at the moment, uh, so under the proposals, what they'd have to do is probably get a bus from the estate onto, to, onto the A56, then get a, a bus from there down to Stretford, and then a bus from there to either the Trafford Centre or uh, to Trafford General. I think it's, it's something like what should be a relatively short journey by a uh, simple bus route now could potentially up to three buses they might have to take to take those journeys and I think I do echo the concerns that Council Evans has raised. It's, it's just a comment, I'd like to welcome the new 502503 service uh, which is replacing the uh, withdrawn, the surface withdrawn by first. It is a vital service and I'd just like to thank the officers and the new bus operators for putting that service in. Thank you. Yeah, Chair, more than happy to individually meet with the councillors and we can talk through what some of the difficulties are. Thank you. And look, yes, Councillor Bray. Thanks, Chair. I just want to um, talk about the changes proposed on pages 67 and 68. Whole raft of changes caused by first bus 
for some unknown reason, pulling out of Ashton on the line town. And uh, I'd like to thank the officers for allowing me to come in the office and go through these changes one by one, route by route, and for the efforts they've made in, in getting alternative provision made in such a short term. Thanks very much. Uh, no more questions? All right, we'll move on to item nine, which is the draft work programme. Um, an XP. An XP. Oh, sorry, an XP. Where, where? I'm quite happy, to, quite happy to move on, Chair, but I think we should give members the opportunity to... <laughs> so, so, Annex B, um, these are, uh, are the services that have been changed commercially that we feel we want to step in. There was a feeling there in the, in the Ashton area to, to support the 389, so we've, we've worked on a de minimis contract with Stagecoach there, and members will be... Um, familiar because it was raised at the last meeting, we are reintroducing the uh, these services back in September following the, uh, the summer timetable. Questions for Annex B? Right, hang on. <laughs> Thanks, Chair. It's on service number 389. Um, this is one where there will be an effect in the fact that the service will be curtailed at U3 rather than continuing on to Hyde. And I just wondered, I've had questions asked since about the ticketing arrangements. I know officers have said in the report that other alternative uh, bus services are available from the U3 area, but wh whether, you, whether or not you'll be able to use that ticketing thing, that's what I want to ask the officers. And if not, is there any possibility we could continue it on from you, Chiri, to Hyde. So my understanding is, if it's because it's a different operator, it will refer to the System 1 ticket, which is the, the, the ticket that represents all operators. And again, we'll have to go away and have if, if there's further comments to be made on the nature of the route, pick that up with Nick. Nick, do you want to come in? Thank you, Chair. Um, can I just ask, the, with regards to the V1, V4, um, and that we have the summer timetable, how many weeks is the summer timetable for? When does it start and finish? Um, and, sorry, and when we go back on the 1st of September, um, obviously at the end period, will the service be resumed as it was before the summer timetable? Um, yeah, the weather doesn't give us many clues, does it? it we, we, we summer timetable finishes on the uh, 2nd of September, what, that's when the, the, the new time table reverts. And my understanding is, Guy can just confirm this with me, that we are referring virtually identically to the service that was run previously to the summer timetable. Yes, we're in discussions with yourself. It's virtually the same timetable as uh, we're looking at doing a few tw uh, minor tweaks to it, uh, some of which are improvements. It's just to better match demand. So certainly no worse off. It finishes on the second of September, new timetable, second of September, so it was, uh, the summer timetable was in for six weeks in total. Thank you, Councillor Leach. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, just in relation to the um, 389 service and the, um, the short-term funding till January 2020, um, I just wondered whether this length of time for this service uh, to be funded gives, gives, it enough, gives enough time to work out whether or not this service can actually then be a, a non-subsidised service, um, because it's only a fairly short period of time. I just wondered what the logic was to have it just running up to January rather than, uh, rather than uh, a longer period than that. Um, and I think, I think it's a good idea um, for us to be short-term funding something in the hope that we are going to get a commercial service out of it. Um, but if it proves to be a um, very decent commercial service, is there any uh, potential for clawback of the, 
uh, of the funding that we provide in the short term, uh, or is that definitely that money is definitely used up and, and is non-returnable? Or are there, because this is the first time that I've seen something like this in the time that I've been on the committee where we've uh, decided to um, subsidise something for a, a short period with the assumption that it's going to be reviewed and possibly not funded in the long term. And this might actually be a good way of keeping services that we're losing uh, potentially in the future, keeping services running in the hope that another operator can take something on and, uh, and run it commercially. Uh, thank you, Councillor Leach, for your question. I'll bring in Adam in, in a minute. Um, certainly, this is something that we're, we do regularly look at when we're speaking to operators to try and encourage them to, to consider um, limited funding times. Um, I'll, I'll let Adam come in in a minute to, to, to whether three or four months is, is, enough, is enough. Um, I think I'd be very surprised if he'd be happy to give us back the money after that period, but it's, it's a question that I'll quite happily bounce over to him. Thank you, Chair. It's uh, going back to the 389, um, uh, the reduction in services through parts of Hyde and G Cross. I appreciate the work that you've done, uh, but you mentioned that um, not Lane, 450 yards, if you're elderly or disabled, not Lane's like that. In parts, you'd be absolutely knackered by the time you got to D Dowson Road. It's not acceptable. Um, it'd take you two hours to get to Ashton Hospital from uh, parts of Hyde, G Cross, and Newton. Uh, and I know that's a fact because my wife did it when I was in the hospital last year. You had to get a bus into Ashton, a bus into Hyde, and then a bus back. It's two hours. There's no bus service now that, that links Hyde directly to the hospital. Okay, happy, happy to take away and look at those details. I mean, I think it is an important point to look at the top topography. Um, often we forget that there are hills out there. We do work to around about 400 metres when we're, we're looking at services. But just to remind members that we do have ring ride services as well, and we'll always look to promote that as an alternative for people that might have mobility issues. Um, I was going to bring Adam in for a question, if I may, Chair. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, so, obviously, the notice period we got for the services was around eight weeks, where we had to look at, you know, the patronage data, what the existing services were. Could we come up with something that would sort of fill that void and not leave communities unserved? Uh, we put forward a proposal to TFGM for the 336, 337, 389, and what we said at the time was, you know, we would be happy to run those services until the January service change date. Uh, and that would enable us to uh, obtain further patronage information from the services that we're operating. So, you know, it's, the idea was that it, we didn't want to commit to something that was undeliverable going forward. We wanted to provide a service, maintain a service, and then hopefully be able to make those services viable. And, you know, if the 389 is a roaring success, then what we would like to do is, you know, look at expanding the service rather than, you know, just saying, there's the money back, you know, we'll, we'll operate as we are, you know, provide some earlier morning journeys, later evening journeys, and do it that way, and then you know, hopefully, grow the market and make the services sustainable in the future. Thanks, yeah. Um, just to, just to comment, a general disappointment in terms of the number of services commercially that have been withdrawn and the, the impact of uh, it might have on the subsidised services. But specifically to do with uh, with some of the um, changes in Oldham, um, we've had some representation from uh, ward colleagues. Uh, and can I suggest that rather than discussing it in this meeting, if we have an opportunity to discuss it in detail uh, outside of this meeting, I, I, I would welcome that. Thank you. Yeah, very quickly, Chair. Um, Annex C is really where officers have tried to mirror changes to the subsidi subsidised network just to reflect what some of the changes have made, been made by the, the commercial ones. So just to try and, and make things reflect the daytime stuff and make things better for the customer. So that's, that's the basis of most of the changes in Annex C. Annex C? No. Uh, can I uh, go through the, uh, what we're agreeing now and what we're approving? Uh, to note in command as appropriate on the changes, that's just to note. Are we agreeing that no action is proposed in, expect, in, in respect of Annex A? Okay. 
are we agreeing that the proposed action is taken in respect of changes or deregistered commercial services as set out in Annex B? Okay. Uh, and to approve the proposed changes to general subsidised service set out in Annex C. Okay, those are carried. Yep. Could you just clarify what you're doing about Annex A? I, I do have a pending query there and don't just want it crossed over. So, uh, so there might be some action. Well, I might you're only noting it, you're not approving okay, it. Okay, that's fine. Great, thank you. Okay. Right, we'll go to item nine. GM Transport Committee Work Programme. Uh, Gwyn, Gwyn Williams. Thank you, oh, Chair. Right, sorry. <laughs> um, within the papers is the committee's updated work programme. Um, the August, December and March meetings have been included since last time. At the last meeting, members suggested a number of items. Um, a couple of those could be grouped together, I think, as road safety themes, and the um, governance team will be working with um, TFGM officers to program them at an appropriate juncture. If members have any other comments or items that they would like adding, we'd be happy to receive them. Okay. Right, before, before I take questions, can I just say that uh, you, I don't quite, in October you've got Metrolink Annual Performance and Annual Deep Dive Report. So it, would that just be on Metrolink? Now we had Rail and Metrolink, would that just be on Metrolink? Right, so when are we having a deep dive on rail? We'll, we'll go back to offices and we'll work that out. It's the same okay. meeting. It's the same meeting, but it's not Ah, oh, yeah, it's on the next page. That's a, mail, a rail annual performance report. It's not a deep dive. Exactly, we want to do a deep dive as well. All oh, right, so okay. Well, I'll let we'll you off. We'll clarify it. Right, I'll start taking questions. Councillor Sykes? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, I'm sure. Well, I do know I raised it at a previous meeting. I don't see it at all on the list. Mm -hmm. Was the speed camera partnership and whatever? And I'm just wondering where does that feature in the program? Um, I think it's quite urgent. It seems um, it's not working properly. Um, it does have a substantial amount of money, uh, and it seems to be accountable as a body to nobody, and has no elected members on it, but makes decisions that impact on all the communities we represent around this room. So. Um, could I make a plea once again, third time, uh, that that's dealt with sooner rather than later, and certainly before Christmas. Okay. Thank you, Chair. P perhaps I've missed it, or perhaps it's been rolled into someone else. I did mention at the last meeting a piece of policy development work to be done on our smaller and um, more deprived communities and their sort of relationship with the transport network. Um, could you advise how we, we fit that in, or could we at least put that in as something to be scheduled for... A, a later meeting. Thank you. Councillor Mellor. Thank you, Chair. Um, a, a, a few things, really. I think, first of all, I don't know where I don't know whether it would be in, as part of one update or if we could have it as a separate update. I think I'd prefer to have it as a separate update, but I'd like a particular focus on tram train and, and, and how we're going on with tram train and, and developing that and, and the updates in terms of any trials that are going on. Um, I quite appreciate as well in terms of an update for our pass, the, the rollout for our pass, particularly um, focusing on how it's being promoted um, across Greater Manchester. Um, the, 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 you know, the, there are some concerns that maybe some, some um, of those who can access it still aren't aware that, that they can access, access it. Um, and I guess that really links into whether it's um, one overall update or we could have it as separate updates. I guess really for me what I'm very, very keen on is seeing the progress in rolling out our network as part of obviously I guess the TFGM 2040 plan. Um, but for me I think I, I would really, really appreciate if there was a particular focus um, on, on how we're doing in terms of tram train, um, certainly for, for, from my perspective. Thank you. Councillor Burke. Thanks, Chair. At the last meeting, I raised the concerns regarding bus lane cameras and asked if we could have a full breakdown of how many authorities have active bus lane cameras in operation and the breakdown of how many fines are being issued in these authorities. We'll take that forward. Councillor Adshead. Thank you, uh, Chair. Just a very quick comment. Uh, sort of uh, welcoming the sort of uh, 
the proposed draft programme as, as it keeps coming forward. Because it is really it's a, a programme we can see in advance and we can actually ask questions. So I think that the, the way it's done is actually quite helpful to us actually see what's coming in a few months' time. It helps us, I think, as members to actually plan as well and see what's coming up. I realise, of course, it's a live document and it will change. And that's actually he very helpful in itself. So just thank you for that, the work on that. I think it's actually very helpful to us. Uh, thank you, Chair. Two queries. One, showing some ignorance. Can someone explain to me exactly what a deep dive report is as opposed to a normal report? Uh, and then my second and more substantial point is in relation to the fact that we don't yet have um, a uh, scheduled date for the um, update on progress in relation to bus reform, which obviously has very significant impact on um, the costs and uh, potentially subs uh, and the uh, and the whole subsidised service network. Uh, so I just wondered why that hadn't yet been scheduled, and a plea that this is scheduled um, urgently. So we're not not getting it at the end of the year. We're getting it fairly soon. Sylvia will pick all those up. Okay. Any more questions, comments? Yes, Councillor Bray. Bus reform is meant the very last item. Bus reform's on the list to be scheduled, so we've not set a date for that one. So we've got some more work to do between officers, and then we'll come back to the next meeting with some dates added in. So hopefully it'll be before March. Councillor Leach, you want I didn't get an answer on my deep dive report question. More detailed. Can we have it in English in future, please? Questions? No? Well, we'll move on to item 10, exclusion of press and public. Can somebody move it? Thank you.